The most successful people in the world, healthy, wealthy, or wise, choose education over entertainment. Location has energy and time has memory. Change can never happen if someone has to lose. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Top 10, I got a top 10. Top 10. Got my motivation high for my top 10. Gotta learn from the wise women and men. It's Evan Carmichael and I make these videos because chances are you are the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more and you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today let's learn from one of the best, Jay Shetty and my take on his top 10 rules for success. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one, add meaning. There's a difference between a lack of expertise and inexperience. Right? We think we lack expertise in something, but actually we're just inexperienced at it. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the point of that second element of, you don't have to be the best at something when you start doing it, but as soon as you start doing it, you've now given yourself that opportunity to grow. And, and I think we all know this, there's always something we've all learned and become better at it. But if you're fascinated by it, you're probably more likely to invest more time. Right. And so yeah, don't, but it is also important, there may be things in your life that you have an expertise in, but you don't have a passion in, but then ask yourself the question, why don't I have a passion in it? Because you could add meaning to it. Like there are so many skills that we have that if you added a bit of meaning, you added some purpose to it, you added why you were doing it, you could actually find a great use for it. And I think a lot of us are under, under, underestimating how powerful expertise is. You may have strengths that are just underutilized by your current job but actually could be really well utilized by someone that you felt activated you. Rule number two, choose education over entertainment. One of my biggest beliefs, and I read a study that inspired my beginning, and it was that the most successful people in the world, healthy, wealthy, or wise, choose education over entertainment. And the most unsuccessful people in the world, unhealthy, unwealthy, or unwise, choose entertainment over education. So I made it my mission in life to build entertainment first content with an educational heart. And I was thinking, how do we make wisdom spread at the pace people want entertainment? How do we meet people where they are so that they can come on a journey with us? How do we meet people? Because guess what? Hundreds of thousands of people will do courses, millions of people will come to events, but billions will always watch television and network TV and online programming. How do we meet people there? So a big part of my vision and goal is to create conscious content that will sit on all the platforms that everyone binge watches, will be extremely entertaining that you won't even know, but it will have the most meaningful messages behind it. Rule number three, express kindness. One of the best things I like to talk about is just small acts of kindness, right? Small acts of kindness and throw gratitude around like it's confetti, right? Throw kindness and gratitude around like they're confetti. Like when you've got confetti, when you've got a wedding or a party or whatever it is, you just, you just sprinkle on everyone. It's exciting to throw it on everyone. You see that sprinkle where it falls on their hair. Maybe if they're too, if they're too conscious about their hair, they may not like it, right? But we, we enjoy that feeling and we need to do the same with kindness and gratitude. And that's something we can do all day, just small thank yous to everyone, appreciating people, being grateful to people, you know, just keeping the door open for individuals, asking people if they need a hand with something that they're doing. There are so many unlimited opportunities in a day to express kindness if that's what you want. Now, I'll give you an example. When I was on my flight here from New York on Tuesday, I was flying over from London back to New York and when I was flying over, I'd forgotten to book myself a vegan meal on the flight. Now, when that happens, I usually end up having to starve because they don't necessarily have any other options. But the amazing thing is that the, uh, the stewardess was so nice. She was, she was extremely kind. She was, she was like, don't worry that you haven't booked it. It happens all the time. And she went as far as offering me her own meal because that was the only meal that I could eat on the plane. Now, I declined, I politely declined, but I was so touched. Right? She didn't have to do that. She was actually going to give up her own meal so that I could eat when, when that was packed for her. And it was actually my fault that I'd forgotten to book my own meal. 
And I was touched by that, you know? I was, I was just like, wow, that's so kind of you. And so obviously I declined. I didn't want to steal her meal. And I'd luckily pack some lunch because I know that I'm terrible at booking these kind of things. And so in the end, and I took out some stuff. Then she told me that actually she was trying to be vegan, etc. So I shared one of my, and she said the reason why she's struggling is because she loves chocolate. So I shared one of my, these, these homemade chocolate uh, cakes thing, uh, I think it was a chocolate brownie, I shared it with her and she was really happy. And I was just thinking, it was such a small, insignificant act of kindness. It took no effort. It took no meaning. It wasn't difficult. I was on a flight. But that reciprocal exchange starts bringing that domino effect where we start making kindness exponential. Right, we let kindness escalate throughout the world. Rule number four, put your armor on. The beautiful thing about monk life is half the day is self and half the day is service. That's yeah. how you're taught to live. Okay. So the morning hours are for you to fill yourself. It's almost like putting on mental, emotional, and physical armor. Like that's what a morning routine is. Our days are tiring. Our days are busy. Yeah. Our days are draining. Well, guess what? If you didn't put your armor on in the morning boy, oh boy. and you're going out to battle, how many knives are gonna cut you? Mm. How many swords are gonna pierce you? How many wounds are you gonna come home with? How many of you come back home feeling wounded? Mm. I come back home feeling wounded sometimes, awesome. but guess what? If you put your armor on in the morning, a warrior would never go out onto a battlefield. And life can be a battlefield. Mm. Work can be full of conflict sometimes. Mm. Your relationships can be damaging sometimes. Your friendships can be toxic sometimes. So we are warriors in one sense. Sure. And so without wearing that, so for me a morning routine is putting on emotional armor, Whoa. which is meant to protect you for the rest of the day. Mm. And that way, even if you do get pierced, or you do get popped, or you do get cut, yeah. you're protected. Mm. And I know that when I, my morning routine is at its best, I feel protected. I know exactly. Yeah. Whereas when my morning routine is weakened, mm. I feel weak. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the morning routine, as I get strategic about it, mm. there's two principles you have to know. Location has energy, and time has memory. If you do something in the same place every day, that place now holds that energy. And this is huge, like it's, it's just so big and I'm, I'm grateful for that reaction because Whoa. people don't realize how, how powerful this is. Like when I meditated in temples mm. that were 5,000 years old in South India, mm. it was easier to meditate because people have been meditating there for thousands of years. Wow, it's so good. And so when you find a space in your home, and even if you've got, like I lived in a 500 square foot apartment in New York, mm four years ago, mm -hmm. and I just had a tiny corner which I dedicated to my sacred practices. Mm -hmm. So if you, you don't have to have a big home to do this, you don't have to be wealthy to do this, you can find just a corner in your home wow. that you dedicate as your meditation space or your reflection space. So first thing, location has energy. Second thing, awesome. time has memory. Mm -hmm. And this is something that people underestimate. When you do something at the same time every day, you remember it, and time remembers it. That's why we struggle to work out at different times every day. It's why we struggle, like why do we feel hungry at the same time every day? Generally, we feel hungry at the same time. Most people, if you've got a regulated diet, you will feel hungry. You will feel tired at the same time every day. You will look towards that Coke can or that sugar or that chocolate bar at the same time every day. And so when you're meditating at the same time, if you're exercising at the same time, so what I recommend to people ah, wow, wow. is your morning routine needs four aspects, and it's simple, and I call it time. It's about making time in the day. Okay. So time stands for T-I-M-E. T stands for thankfulness. There needs to be, even if it's five minutes, five minutes of thankfulness, of gratitude every single morning, and that has to be gratitude that's specific. It can't be gratitude that's generic. So generic gratitude is something that anyone could be grateful for. Oh, I'm grateful for the sky. I'm grateful for air. I'm grateful for water. That's cool, but it's generic gratitude. Specific gratitude is I'm grateful for the fact that I have someone calling me this morning. I'm grateful for the fact that I can still call my parents. I'm grateful for the fact that I have this person in my business who is having such an impact. I'm grateful, you know, it's specific. Specificity. Yeah, so thankfulness. Second one is insight. I think this is one thing that a lot of people are missing, which I recommend people listening to you. It's like podcasts, books, and, and make it easier for yourself. If you get this book, leave it open on your bedside table. 
Leave it open on your kitchen table. Leave it open on your dining table. I guarantee you, you will read more and what you read will speak to you. And I think people underestimate that, that literally like when you have it open and you'll just flick to a chapter randomly and you'll pick up one line, it will impact you and it'll speak to you. So insight, you need insight every day. M is meditation. And I believe meditation is different for different people. As monks, we did walking meditations. We did beach meditations. We did visualizations. We did breath work. Find your meditation practice. I give a ton in the book. And fourth, obviously exercise, which you can speak to even more than I can. Mm -hmm. I exercise to keep fit. You look amazing too though. But it's an exercise. Everyone needs to find five minutes a day, 15 minutes a day of exercise. Everyone, I have been reading a bit from my friend's book, Evan Carmichael, Built to Serve, and I wanted to share this with you. So according to a study by Carnegie Mellon University, people with supportive spouses are more likely to give themselves the chance to succeed. They studied 163 married couples and found that people with supportive spouses were more likely to take on potentially rewarding challenges. Those who accepted challenges experienced more personal growth, happiness, and psychological well-being. Now, I can truly say that I've experienced that in my life. When I first met my wife, I was just starting out. I had never released a video. I hadn't created any content. And she was such an important part of feeling supported on that journey. So whether you're in a relationship, whether you're dating, whether you're married, or even if you're single, being supported by friends and a strong community is important. Uh, Build to Serve by Ellen Carmichael, great book on how you can find your purpose and also on reminding us that we can all make a difference in the world. Thanks, Evan. Rule number five, build adaptability. No one had the guidebook for 2020 up their sleeve or no one could even have expected themselves to be ready for this. Like, no matter how good you are at predicting or trends or whatever it is, 99% of people did not see this coming. And so there needs to be a bit of self-compassion and not judging ourselves. It's so easy to get into that spiral of one of the pieces of negativity is judgment of self, like judging ourselves for not being the best parents, not being the best partners, not being the best people. And that's not a get out of jail free card to behave how you want. What that is, is genuinely allowing yourself to say, hey, I need a bit of time just to adapt and be compassionate because no one had the mindset or the plan. No, this, this is a black swan event yeah, for everybody. This is totally like, yeah, this is, this is crazy. And so it's so extreme. But what should happen, and we were talking about this earlier, Brendan, is that in this moment, you now shift to go, okay, I get it. I'm going to build the muscles that are going to help me build adaptability and resilience for this forever. So I'm never going to be blindsided again or I never want to be in a situation again where I don't have the tools. So when you're thinking like a monk, for this situation and the negativity, the first thing that a monk does is it's about putting on your own protective shield. A lot of us walk out onto the battlefield of life without having done our own training and our own uh, shielding and our own protection. And so one of the ways or a very simple practical way you can transform your environment is a 3S model that I give in the book. And it's sights, scents, and sounds. Now, sights, scents, and sounds have a huge impact on your personal shield and the strength of your shield. And so when we look at sights, sights is what you see. So the big question I'd ask, Brendan, anyone who's listening or watching right now, is what's the first thing you see in the morning? Mm. If it's your phone, and studies show that 80% of people see their phone before their partner in the morning and the evening, Brendan, right? Can you imagine yeah, the yeah. phone is the last thing you see and the first thing you see in the morning when you wake up? When you do that- I would be I, awful. I, I would be <laughs> awful. I, I would be awful too. I mean, I, you know, this is the point that you can't put yourself in a, uh, you know, something I often say is like, you know, monks are not training in a strip club. Like you don't put yourself in the, the complete extreme opportunity. Op- like, yeah, sorry for my crudeness, but- you I get, love it, I love it. You're not putting yourself in an environment where you're set up to lose when you're training, right? When you're strong, you can put yourself in extreme environments, but when yes. you're training, you make, it, you make it yourself work. So if you're waking up in the morning, make the first thing you see be a quote you love. Make it be a work of art that inspires you. Make it be a picture of your family that really means something to you. But make it the first thing you see. It could be on your bedside table, it could be on your ceiling, wherever it is that you look first. Make it something that makes you pause because otherwise when you dive into your phone, you're now reacting to everyone's agenda, 
everyone's focused, the news, the negativity, and you're now starting your day with people filling you up rather than you being an abundant creator. Love that. And so the first thing I'd say is sight. The second thing I'd say is you've got to change your sounds in your life. And as monks, sound design was huge. So I discovered this when I lived in New York City for two years. And I used to find myself feeling quite mentally tired. And I was always wondering what it was. And so I started researching and reading, as we do. And I read about this thing called cognitive load. And it was saying that when you're processing insignificant, irrelevant sound, your brain is trying to process something that doesn't actually have meaning or use. And so now you're wasting 80% of your brain's energy on cognitive load. So examples are having the news on in the background. Examples are being around culture where there's a lot of noise and gossip, drilling, construction work. All of that creates cognitive load. Now, sound, how can you change it? We all know, Brendan, and you do this at your seminars beautifully. You put on music and everyone's jumping up and down. And yeah. sound has that energy to change our physiology and has that chance. Sound has the opportunity to change our biology. And so for me, what sound are you playing in your work environment? Is it the mm. sound you want intentionally? What's the sound that you wake up to? By the way, why does anyone wake up to an alarm? Right. Like, why would you? Bam, wake up? Bam, bam. <laughs> None of us would want to wake up to a fire alarm. So change the <laughs> sounds that you work to, that you cook to, that you sleep to, and you'll see your anxiety just de depreciate. Uh, and the third one is uh, sense. I think scents are so underestimated. When you smell a food you love, you're mm. already tasting it. You're feeling it. You're feeling the benefit of it. There's a reason why when we walk into a massage room. And I remember when we were in Puerto Rico, we went for one of those beautiful, which you recommended to me that I couldn't miss it. It was one of those treetop massages. Yeah. <laughs> it's a beautiful place. And so I went for one of those. It's amazing. But massage parlors or spaces or whatever, it is, spas or whatever they're called, they all have scents like lavender, eucalyptus, sandalwood. This isn't just like to make you feel good for two seconds. When you breathe and inhale that, it mm. reduces your reaction, the desire for negativity, it brings that positivity into your life. So if you're creating these habits in your day, you'll find that the external negativity is still there. It's not changing it, but it's able to less penetrate your shield. Rule number six, empower your choice element. How much of the world do you think we receive by being here? And how much of the world do we create ourselves? Yeah, that's a beautiful question. It's, it's a complete dynamic dance between what the Vedic tradition would call fate and free will. So fate is what is already created for you, and a good example would be the place you were born, mm -hmm. the type of family you grew up in, the socioeconomic background you had. It was already there when you walked into the world. But within that, you had choices where your free will came about. Mm. You had the choice to either do what everyone in your neighborhood did, or to do something different. You had the choice to have a relationship with a particular person or not. So what happens is that we're constantly creating new spaces from which we have another choice. Right. And so you kind of see it as this dynamic dance between, okay, now I'm in this situation, and now what is my choice in this situation? So I would say, I wouldn't, I'm not saying it's equal, I'm saying it's a dynamic balance and a switching process yeah where you're constantly creating a new level, and then now in that level you have a next choice. Because mm -hmm. we, we didn't have the choice to be created here. We, didn't, we were here, and that wasn't our choice. Now everything after that is our choice, right? Yeah, and there are some, there, obviously there are some traditions, and I'm a, I'm a big mm -hmm. diver into like reincarnation and past lives, so according to the beliefs of reincarnation and past lives, you have at some point made a choice mm -hmm. to be here. But taking it more simplistically, the truth is that when you're brought into a situation, it's uh, the best analogy that I've heard and, and it's been told for years is of a father is an alcoholic. One of the sons that he has decides to become an alcoholic because his father's an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. The other son decides to never drink alcohol because his father's an alcoholic. Right, right. So they were exposed to the same situation and same scenario. Same environment. Same environment. But they both made different choices based on their experience. And that's the choice element. That's the element that we should be trying to empower in our lives because we can constantly say I'm limited by my environment or I've been restricted by my environment and hey it's true there are so many of us that have been limited and restricted but by now you repeating that you are going to repeat that restriction in your life.
Rule number seven, develop self-awareness. Intuition comes from asking yourself questions, basic questions, simple questions, just as it would getting to know Rich, getting to know Jay is the same process. After I eat something, did I like that? Did I not like it? The next morning, did I like that? Did I not like it? When you ask people, what are your favorite movies? You know how you feel when you walk outside a movie. No, you don't need to do a personality test. You don't need to do uh, a, a three months away in Costa Rica. Like, you don't need to do that to know whether you like something or you don't like something. You can do a sense check with yourself every single day after doing an activity. And if you literally, after you did anything, anything you do, stop and just ask yourself, did I enjoy that? Yes or no, simple question. So let's say I say yes. What did you enjoy about it? Let's have that conversation. What did I enjoy about it? What part of it was uncomfortable, but you still got excited about it? These are three simple questions that can lead you to greater self-awareness. I've done the same with every area of my life, and you should really become like an encyclopedia on your own life. Like, if someone goes to me, what's your favorite movie? It's like, I am a big fan of thrillers. My favorite director and producer of all time is Christopher Nolan. My favorite mo mo movies are Memento, The Prestige, Inception, Interstellar, and The Dark Knight mm -hmm. Trilogy. They're all Christopher Nolan movies. It's, there's such a pattern in our lives, and everyone has that pattern. We just have to look beyond the debris that's all there of the noise and the, the dirt that's stopping us because there's just so much distraction. Rule number eight, be honest with yourself. Ego is demonstrated in two ways. So ego is either I am the best in the world and I think I'm better than everyone, or ego says you're the worst in the world, you're the worst than everyone, you're, you're much worse than everyone. Or you say my life is the best and the greatest, my life is the worst, right? Yeah. My life is far worse than anyone else. So the ego likes to push you to the extreme. It doesn't like to give you balance and honesty and reality. It likes to, it wants to make you feel like you've got the worst life in the world and no one else understands it. No one gets that. Only you get in, you get the worst. Or you're the best and no one else gets you. You're, you're untouchable. Mm. And, and people miss that. Yes. They're like, how does that make sense? Exactly like you yeah. said. But it does make sense yes. because the ego wants to be the top or the bottom. bottom but the top of the bottom. Yes. It doesn't just want to be at the bottom. It's got to be it the to be bottom of the bottom. Yeah, it's got to be the bottom of the bottom wow. of the bottom, but the top very, of the bottom, right? Very you know well I mean? set. Yeah, and so we get lost in that and we don't think of it as ego. Yeah. And that's why the only antidote to either ego is self-honesty, mm. is being honest. And mm. honesty is, I'm good at these things, mm -hmm. I'm great at these things, mm -hmm. and I suck at these things, right? Yeah. Like, that's honesty. Yeah. Like, and we could all sit down, me and yeah. you, could sit down with a list of our skills mm -hmm. and map out what we were great at, what we were average at and what we knew we were terrible at. Yes. And that's honesty, that keeps you so away from either ego. Mm. Rule number nine, have compassion. One of the greatest rules for change that I think is not given enough focus is that change can never happen if someone has to lose, mm. right? If someone has to lose in creating a change, that's not change, change is a win win for everyone. And we've heard this in the, you know, I think it's in the seven habits of highly effective people where win-win is like, you know, think win-win. But, but what I'm saying is when you're trying to create a change, don't look at it as like, I'm right and that person's wrong. As soon as you create that, what you've done is you're not created a change, you've created division. Yes. And, and so what we have to do is how do we create a new platform whereby both people are growing above right and wrong, where there's movement above right and wrong. Right and wrong are are stagnant places and places that cause division. But when you're talking about a movement, as you mentioned, that comes when we go beyond right and wrong and we go, this is the direction we need to go in as a society. That's hard to do, but it really is the truth of change. Like the rule of change is stop trying to make someone wrong because that means you're right. Well, guess what? If they're right now, you're wrong. And, mm. and that's, that's never going to create a harmonious society. What we need is where we all go, actually... Let me understand, let me listen, let me really understand why that person thinks that way. And it's not that you agree with them, it's not that you think they're right, it's that you have to give it a chance. I remember when we were, I used to be on my debating society uh, at school, I was super dorky and geeky and uh, I loved, loved debating society. And I remember the first rule of debate was that you could not debate someone if you didn't fully understand their motion and their side. Mm. Like that was the first rule. If you did not understand their motion and their perspective, you, couldn't, you weren't allowed to debate because then you were just debating based on ego. 
Mm. And I think that's the thing that's misleading us is that we're fighting based on our ego and this desire to be right and make stuff happen rather than fighting from a place of compassion, which, which wants collective growth, not just individual growth. And rule number 10, the last one before a very special bonus clip is focus in your environment. You are integral to making change, like you're powerful. If you focus in on your environment, if you connect to becoming the best in that space, you are an incredible asset to yourself, to a team, to other people, to anyone, because all of these are needed. But the worst thing is when we try to do someone else's duty. And there's this great verse in the Bhagavad Gita, which I read as a monk, which says that it's better to do your own nature, even if only 50%, than doing another one's perfectly. When we aim to do someone else's work, even perfectly, we'll always be challenged, we'll always be let down. That's why we feel stress. That's why we feel pressure in life. When you're doing pressure in your own environment, you feel the pressure, but you get through it, you dive through it. Kelly McGonigal talks about that in her book called The Upside of Stress. That when you're working in your passion, stress doesn't feel like stress anymore. You still experience it, it just doesn't feel like it. But when you're not working in your passion, stress feels like stress, pressure feels like pressure, it gets really, really heavy. And we all experience that in our lives. And if you're experiencing that in your career, you're experiencing that in your life, find areas of your day where you can be pursuing your passions. Now I've got a special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy, but before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know, what was your single biggest takeaway from this video, and what is your plan of action for the next week? The science says that when you just watch a video, you get motivated, you get inspired, you have a 35% chance of actually doing something following through. That, Believe Nation, is not enough. 35% is not enough, we gotta do something. But when you get inspired by watching a video like this, and then you create a plan of action, your chances of following through jump to 91%. And when you commit publicly, like putting your comment down below with your plan, it jumps to 95%. That's what I want for you. I want you to take action. Your dreams are too important. Your life matters. Your mission has to happen. So, question of the day. Your biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week, put it down in the comments below, and I'm gonna celebrate alongside with you. The challenge with all self-centeredness mm. is that all you then indulge yourself in is your own pain. Well, very good. Right, you just yeah. indulge, you just yeah. submerge and like immerse yourself in pain mm -hmm. because it's all about you. Me. Yeah. And you know, I think Gandhi said it best is that you find yourself when you lose yourself in the service of others. And what I love about that statement is that what he means by that is, and, and empaths get this mixed yeah. up sometimes, so I wanna clarify, because a lot of people who are empaths who are listening are like, Jay, I'm always trying to help people, but then I get screwed over. Mm -hmm. So here's, here's the answer. You're not helping people so that they can thank you. You're not helping people so that they can be grateful to you. You're helping people because you know it's the right thing to do, but more importantly, you're helping people because you get to understand and experiment and experience different parts of yourself. Wow. When I helped, uh, kids growing up in India that were that didn't have food and we were giving them free food I learned so much about myself when I was able to go and give talks that help people or now I make videos or podcasts You learn more about yourself when you help people you don't learn anything about yourself When you're just sitting there filling out a quiz going who am I what am I like you don't figure you, But you learn about yourself when you help people and and this is what we don't realize I can't remember who said it recently it was someone saying about Jeff Bezos, but they were saying that, you know, the, the scale at which you succeed is the depth of the problem you solve. <laughs> and so even if you look at someone like Jeff Bezos, who's extremely successful, okay. he's successful because he solved a problem that many people have. Mm. Bill Gates is successful because he solved a problem. So even if you look at monetary success, even if you look at financial success, it comes from service. <laughs> Any success comes from service. A musician is famous mm. because they're serving. Mm. They're serving you by understanding your feelings, making music, mm. you now feel comforted, so you follow them. They have served you. Wow. So don't think of service as just charity and giving money, which are beautiful things which we all should do, mm -hmm. but don't just limit your life to thinking, I serve on the weekends, or I serve once a year. Really? You can serve every moment. This podcast is a service. No question right It's now. your service, because yeah. you're serving people by giving them an alternative mm. to just watching some trash show, mm. but they're actually here learning from you and learning from the people that you bring on the show. If you want 10 more amazing rules from Jay Shetty, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. 
continue to believe and I'll see you there. Do not accept inexperience for weakness. Do not, do not just sit there and go, I don't have that as a natural gift. Yes. And this is one of the reasons why I'm going into a soccer analogy here, sorry, but it was why I admire so many 